There's many reasons to explain how the city of Detroit has fallen so hard, but no event other than the riots of 1967 can be credited more so for Detroit's long economic downward spiral. We'll talk about that and more throughout this video. After losing in a rap battle nearby, pretty badly if I do say so myself, I decided that it's best if I just stuck to driving tour videos. And with that said, I began the video at the Lincoln Street Art Park. This park was formed by artists who took recyclables and used graffiti to turn this particular abandoned industrial site into something that ended up being quite unique. When I visited, construction had just started on transforming the old abandoned warehouse into a mixed-use building that will offer affordable housing. It's going to be a good thing for this community, and hopefully this development can spark some momentum and continue further developments in the area and make it more attractive. Are you saying that you support gentrification? How dare you? Plus, how can you say that it's a good thing for the city when it's destroying a beautiful art project that was created by members of the community? Get out of town and don't come back. You have no idea what's best for us. Detroit versus everybody, fool. <laughs> gentrification, you say, eh? Well, how can you say that new affordable housing is bad for the community? Affordable housing, key words. 50% of the housing units are reserved for households that make 50% or less of Metro Detroit's median household income. I think there's a lot of people that confuse gentrification for what's actually going on with half of these residential projects. That sounds like what this community needs, though. New affordable housing. And the art isn't going away. The project is making it a priority to make sure that the lot continues to be used for the art community in Detroit. Before this project, art was displayed on abandoned buildings and unkept land. Now it's going to be an official community with some residential units and some things added like a coffee shop or two. So it should be nice. Well, this is going to be video number 12 in my Detroit series, where I end up going through the entire city. Well, this section is bounded by Elmhurst to the north, the Lodge Freeway to the east, I-94 to the south, and I-96 to the west. Throughout most of this video, you're going to see a lot of abandoned stuff. However, you're also going to see one of Detroit's nicer kept neighborhoods, which is the Boston Edison neighborhood. We already saw part of it in a previous video. We're going to see the rest of it in this video. This section of the city has one of the most important historical markers in Detroit, and it's where the infamous Detroit riots of 1967 started. Sometimes it's referred to as the 12th Street Riots. That event spurred the momentum of Detroit's economic downward spiral, and it's considered to be among the most violent and destructive riots in U.S. history. Of course, we'll talk more about that later on. Other things of note in this video includes the Motown Museum, the abandoned Lee Plaza, and other architectural buildings in which some are still used today, while others have become abandoned over time. In fact, smack dab in the middle of the hood to the right is the Motown Museum, aka Hitsville, USA. This is the original location for the headquarters of Motown Records, and you can go inside and see Studio A, which was the recording studio where many of the original Motown hits were created. At the time of me uploading this video, the museum is closed for construction as it's undergoing expansions. Should be open for tours again by summer of this year, which is 2022. However, back in the year 1959, Barry Gordy Jr. founded Tamla Records, and he later that year added Motown Records. In that same year, Gordy Jr. purchased the property where the museum sits today, and it was used as the main studio for both the Tamla and Motown record labels. Among the first artists to make music under the Motown label include Stevie Wonder, The Supremes, The Marvelettes, Marvin Gaye, Smokey Robinson, and The Temptations. These artists focused on soul music, and it quickly became a popular new genre across this country. Not only was it popular among black Americans, but it was also popular among white Americans too, and during the 1960s, that was truly something special.
And yes, what you just saw was the new Cancer Center, which is an addition to the already large Henry Ford Hospital. The new addition created hundreds of new jobs and it cleared out what used to be some abandoned buildings and empty lots. Hopefully that, combined with the new expansion of the Motown Museum and the transformation of the Lincoln Street Art Park, can make this West Grand Boulevard corridor a more desirable place moving forward. You can definitely see some of the potential. Lots of work to be done still, of course, but this is a good start. Some more tidbits about Motown. During the 1960s, Motown had some offices in both New York and LA, and in 1972, Motown moved out of Detroit and made LA the place for their headquarters. In June of 1988, Gordy Jr. sold his ownership of Motown to the Music Corporation of America for $61 million, and today, Motown is owned by the Universal Music Group. Well, really quick, as if you enjoyed this video, make sure to drop a like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already, as doing all of those things helps these videos destroy the evil monster that is the YouTube algorithm. Also, make sure to hit that notification bell and select yes, so that you can be notified every time that I upload a new video. If you enjoyed this video, then you might enjoy checking out my custom-made interactive map that is linked below, and it shows you a visual on all of the places that I've made videos on so far, as I'm giving it my best attempt to visit everywhere in this country. Last but not least, if you can't get enough of me on here, you can always go follow me on my other social media accounts, and those links are below. Well, this is Rosa Parks Boulevard, which used to be called 12th Street. Up ahead, we'll get to the infamous location where Detroit's 1967 12th Street riots took place. The street name changed to Rosa Parks Boulevard in 1976, and for those who don't know, Rosa Parks was a civil rights activist who was born in Alabama in 1913, and she grew up in an era where the KKK helped cause extreme levels of discrimination and violence. Most notably, Parks is known for not giving up her seat to a white passenger in Montgomery, Alabama. That event happened in 1955 when it was the law in Montgomery for black passengers to give up their seat for a white passenger. The bus driver threatened to have Parks arrested, and she still refused to give up her seat. Parks ended up being arrested for violating a city ordinance, and that particular event sparked a large movement of protests around the country. Parks ended up moving to Detroit in 1957. That was when Detroit was in its prime and was seen as a place that could provide many different immigrant groups with a better life, largely due to the thousands of automotive jobs available through the booming auto industry. In fact, Detroit was one of the leading cities to attract black Americans through the Great Migration, and Parks was among the crowd of people to move to Detroit. She settled in a house along Virginia Park Street, and we'll go past it later in the video. However, Parks felt that Detroit back in the 50s and 60s was just as segregated as places were down south, even though racist acts were not as straightforward up north as they were back in Alabama. For example, ordinances were put in place up here just like they were down south, just in different ways. You might not have had a rule in place up here where a black person had to give up their seat for a white person, but in Detroit and in basically every other northern city, blacks settled down in certain parts of town while whites were in other neighborhoods. Not only did that separate the blacks and the whites, but it also created a toxic environment for African Americans. For example, city services were not as well provided in the black neighborhoods as they were in the white neighborhoods. Black people were also not as skilled, nor were they as educated at the time, but that was due to them not being given the same opportunities as white folks had back in the day. Therefore, there was a large income gap between the two demographics. More on that in a minute, as up here to the left is ground zero for Detroit's 1967 riots, or the 12th Street Riots. Today it's called Gordon Park. Anyway, the 1967 riots caused 43 fatalities, 342 people were injured, nearly 1,400 buildings were burned, and over 7,000 National Guard troops were called in to try and calm things down. 
The riots occurred after Detroit police raided an illegal after-hours bar in this black community. These bars were common at the time and were referred to as a blind pig. Inside this particular bar at the corner of Claremont and 12th Street, members of the community were celebrating the return of some servicemen that just came home from Vietnam. Sounds reasonable, right? Well, unfortunately, this bar was illegal and it was unlicensed to operate after hours. So, police came in and arrested all 85 that were inside. This all happened on the morning of July 23rd. At the time, the Detroit police force was made up of mostly white people as only 50 people on the force were black. Reports of police brutality and racial discrimination were strong at the time, and nothing was being done about it. After the arrest of all 85 people inside the bar, police were waiting on vehicles to take everyone who was arrested away. While waiting, a crowd formed outside of the bar, and people started to throw bottles into the street and then eventually at the officers and at their cars. The police officers fled as they were outnumbered. That's when the riots formed, and after a few hours had passed, thousands of people were in the streets rioting. Now's a good time to show an example of this, by the way, as we just passed through the Boston Edison neighborhood, as it consists of a few long blocks along Chicago Boulevard and Boston Boulevard. And that was a white neighborhood back in the day, and you can see that a lot of the houses are still intact and look really nice. And back in the day, black people were not allowed to live in a neighborhood like Boston Edison, so they were forced to settle in Virginia Park, where the riots occurred. Well, anyway, by 6.30 a.m. on July 23rd, the first fire broke out along 12th Street, which was once full of businesses. Some say that there used to be 200 or so businesses along this street, and a lot of the business owners were white and lived in the suburbs, which were way more affluent than the city of Detroit had become. Very little redevelopment has taken place on the empty lots along 12th Street since then, and soon after the first building caught on fire, others started to burn shortly after. The riots took over a 100 block area of the Virginia Park neighborhood that we passed through back there, an area of the city that was home to around 60,000 low income black people. Most of them lived in houses that were divided into smaller apartments. Anyway, by that evening, the National Guard had arrived, and by the end of that Sunday, more than 1,000 people were arrested. However, the riots never settled down as they continued onto the following Wednesday. Army paratroopers arrived patrolling the streets with tanks and armored vehicles in attempts to calm things down, but the riots kept going. Five people died on Sunday, followed by 16 on Monday, 10 on Tuesday, and 12 on Wednesday. After four days, the riots finally ended on Thursday with over 7,000 people arrested. It was expected that around 5,000 people were left homeless, as so many homes and businesses were burned down and destroyed and $50 million worth of property damage was done, which equals about $425 million in the year 2022. Back in 2017, a historical marker was put up at Gordon Park on the corner of Claremont and what is now Rosa Parks Boulevard. The marker was put up on July 23rd, 2017, which marked exactly 50 years since the riots began. During the event, many members of the community came out to observe. Some of you might know that a Netflix movie was made on the Detroit riots, and the members of that cast also came out for that event as well. Really good movie on the whole situation if I do say so myself. And the movie is called Detroit. Anyway, Rosa Parks called Detroit the northern promised land that wasn't, as she saw the same practices of segregation in the Motor City that she saw in Alabama. That word right there, segregation, is why Detroit has fallen so hard. The media never shows just how affluent Detroit's suburbs have been over time. As we all know, negative media sells. Therefore, all that gets shown is the state of Detroit's inner city neighborhoods. But yes, segregation practices that started in the 1930s and 40s is mostly why Detroit looks the way that it does today. There are other factors too, but most of what started it is segregation practices. And the Detroit riots started a lot of that momentum. It encouraged more white families to move to the affluent suburbs, and they took all of their tax dollars with them. 
Employers followed that trend, including Detroit's bread and butter, with the big three automakers. It was cheaper to build newer assembly plants and other factories in the suburbs than to renovate the older and outdated plants within the city. I don't know much about my own grandparents, but I do know that they were a part of that movement, as at least I know that my grandma grew up in the Detroit city limits, only to move out to the suburbs later on because of everything that I just described. That's the way things were back then, and Detroit has long suffered from the mass exodus of wealth. Over time, black families have also moved out once they were able to, as the suburbs provide a better quality of life with better schools, better city services, and less crime. It's been a very long downward spiral that Detroit has not yet been able to get itself out of. The hope now is that the economic turnaround that downtown has been seeing can continue to move outwards from downtown and into the neighborhoods, and we have slowly but surely started to see that, but obviously, a lot of work needs to be done and things need to be done the right way for a very long time at that in order for things to make a complete turnaround. And this area that we're in right now is the 48208 zip code, which today is home to only 9,000 people. The median household income is only $20,000 per year, and the median value of owner-occupied housing units is $74,000, which is actually much higher than 10 years ago. The poverty rate is 45%, and crime is just as bad here as most other inner-city neighborhood areas of Detroit, with violent crime being as high as 2,500 for every 100,000 residents, and the property crime rate being nearly 6,000 for every 100,000 residents. You can't expect anybody to want to move into most areas of the city until the crime can get under control, and it's hard to tell what the solution to that problem is. Detroit actually has a higher amount of police officers per resident than many other large U.S. cities, and with a depleted tax base for a city that's built for nearly 2 million people, it's not like the city can pour in more financial resources to fight crime. As we just crossed Grand Boulevard heading north, we are now in the 48206 zip code, which contains the majority of the Virginia Park neighborhood, which was the epicenter of the 1967 riots. The 48206 is home to 16,000 people, and the median household income is only $23,000 per year. Only 15% of adults 25 and older hold a bachelor's degree or higher, and the median value of owner-occupied housing units is $52,000. The poverty rate is 36%. Crime rates are harder to find for zip codes and neighborhoods than they are for cities themselves, and I was unable to find accurate crime stats for this zip code, but they're probably very similar to those for the entire city of Detroit. Very high, and most people would probably consider it to not be a safe neighborhood to live in. Well, here you can get a good view of the Lee Plaza Hotel, which sits off of West Grand Boulevard. It's become one of the more notable abandoned buildings in Detroit due to its size, mainly. The website historicdetroit.org describes the building as being built originally for Detroit's rich and powerful, only to be ravaged by the city's poor. Lee Plaza was owned by Ralph T. Lee, who made his wealth through owning various real estate properties in the city. Lee Plaza was opened in 1927 as an Art Deco masterpiece and it was deemed as a luxury apartment building that offered hotel services, with 220 different living spaces inside. Demand for luxury apartment living soon became unpopular after the building opened, and in 1968, the city of Detroit turned it into a senior living complex. By 1997, the building was closed, and since then, Lee Plaza has sat vacant. A restoration plan was put in place back in January of 2022, but we'll have to wait and see if anything happens with it, because it's only like the fifth time that someone purchased the building and has announced renovation plans. And you may have noticed that we passed by a school to the left, and that was the Detroit College Prep Academy at Northwestern, which used to just be called Northwestern High School. The athletic teams go by the Colts. There's quite a few notable alumni over the years that attended Northwestern, but I'm only going to name a few. 
One of them is former radio host Casey Kasem, in which most of us can remember listening to his Top 40 show that he hosted for a long time across national airwaves. Another is the singer and songwriter Ray Parker Jr. and another former Motown singer, Mary Wells. Otherwise, it's a bunch of athletes that competed in the Olympics and other professional sports leagues that graduated Northwestern a long time ago, like in the 1960s and 70s. Well, so far in this video, I've talked a lot about what's happened to Detroit's residential neighborhoods and why the city has fallen so hard. And I've talked about some of the landmarks that you can find in this section of the city. There's a few more places of note that we'll pass by, but for the most part, this part of the city is one large ghetto. It's unfortunate, but after the riots of 1967, there's been decades of continuous gang violence and ultra-high crime rates over the years, and that has made people continue to move out, and this is just one section of Detroit that is a shell of its former self. This is considered to be the Petoskey Otsego neighborhood. The name comes from Petoskey Street and Otsego Street. And it's considered to be one of the most poverty-stricken neighborhoods in all of Detroit. And over time, people have continued to move out. Only about 2,000 people are left, and most of it today is vacant, as it's fallen victim to the decades of high crime rates. Well, the truth is, you could go on for hours, circling around many of Detroit's neighborhoods and see urban blight. From here I skip the footage ahead to where Rosa Parks used to live, on the corner of Virginia Park Street and Wildemere. Rosa lived here with her husband, Raymond, on the first floor of this duplex here from 1961 through 1988. It wasn't until 2021 when the house was listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Raymond worked at a barbershop nearby, and Rosa worked at the Stockton Sewing Company. Raymond passed away in 1977, while Rosa lived to be 92 before passing away in 2005. And here's another sad-looking multi-unit residential building further north on Wildemere.
Joy Road might not be much of a joy to be around today, but to the left you have a relic that's been preserved nicely over the years. The Sacred Heart Major Seminary has been around at the corner of Linwood and Joy since 1924, and is still going strong. It was placed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1982. The seminary was opened during Detroit's glory days, and it survived the riots of 1967 and decades of extreme crime rates in the surrounding neighborhoods that has helped cause Detroit to lose over 1 million people. Well now we're just going to see a few more main thoroughfares in this section of the city before finishing things off with the Boston Edison neighborhood. This would be Dexter Avenue and we're heading north. Next, we're going to see a small section of Livernois. It's a major north-south thoroughfare through the Detroit city limits. And then we're going to see Broad Street Avenue. And here it looks like there's some kind of abandoned elementary school or something.
And now we're at the corner of Joy and Broad Street Avenue, and we're going to skip ahead to see Linwood Street. Soon, we're going to be at Central High School, home of the Trailblazers. This school has been around for a very long time, since 1896 to be exact. It's the oldest operating school among the Detroit public schools, and there's a lot of notable alumni, but among the most notable includes billionaire businessman Eli Broad and former NFL tight end Antonio Gates. Well, we're going to finish things off by going through the Boston Edison neighborhood, which is full of very nice old homes. And if you were to buy one today, it would cost you a fortune. It'd be like buying a house in Detroit's wealthier suburbs to the north and west, or maybe like buying one in Gross Point. Today, the neighborhood has nearly 1,000 homes that were constructed between 1905 and 1925. Henry Ford used to be a resident of this neighborhood, and other notable Detroit elites include James Cousins, Horace Rackham, Kmart founder Sebastian Kresge, and the famous boxer from Detroit, Joe Lewis. The Boston Edison neighborhood today is home to 3,300 people, and the median household income is $70,000 per year which for a neighborhood inside the city limits of Detroit is like Beverly Hills. 41% of adults 25 and older hold a bachelor's degree or higher, and the median value of owner-occupied housing units is $200,000. But any time that one goes up on the market, you can expect to pay somewhere around $500,000. That is, unless the house needs work. And now we're back to Linwood Street and we'll head down Boston Boulevard. Thank you. 
Well, that's about it for this video, and if you enjoyed this video, make sure to drop a like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already, as doing all of those things helps these videos destroy the evil monster that is the YouTube algorithm. Also, make sure to hit that notification bell and select yes, so that you can be notified every time that I upload a new video. If you enjoyed this video, then you might enjoy checking out some of the featured playlists on this channel. Videos with amazing insights on other places like what you saw here can be found in my Detroit playlist, my Michigan playlist, or in my American Hoods playlist. Last but not least, if you can't get enough of me on here, you can always go follow me on my other social media accounts, and those links are below. We'll see you next time. Peace!